Um, I'm Pastor Christina, and I'm so happy to talk with you this morning. Um, just an interesting time of year. I love this season so much. And just being able to think about um, what Jesus actually gave up for us is incredible. So we're in the Advent series. This week we're going to be talking about love. So God is love. And we're going to be mainly in the chapter of First John. I know, we're not in Luke chapter 2. It's weird. <laughs> um, so, um, okay. On the next slide, we'll just pull up uh, the image, well-known image. I should quiz you all. Where was Jesus born? <laughs> In a stable, yes. Okay. So throughout history, we see God's desire for intimacy with his people and his plan to restore the broken connection unfolding, the connection that was broken of our own selfishness and restored only by Jesus himself. Through his love, God's love and his desire for intimacy with his creation is visible throughout the Bible, even starting in Genesis, continuing in the relationship, the covenant of Abraham, the blessings and the promises to David about his kingdom lasting forever. And then, of course, in the Gospels, as we learn about Jesus and him stepping out of heaven and into that manger and the significance of that. It continues through his sacrifice and resurrection for us. All the way through scripture, we see the breath of God's love. But we don't have a week to stand here and preach. So today we are going to narrow down on just a couple of things um, that we're going to highlight. Um, so... One thing that we have to talk about is also our response to Jesus' love. So that we'll talk about that today. But we're mainly going to focus on his gift, our response, and Advent being the anticipation of the Messiah, but also we are currently in anticipation of his return. Something special. So if you have your Bibles... We'll turn to chapter 4 of 1 John. Now, there's a lot in chapter 3, too. You can go ahead and read that on your own time. I really wanted to narrow it down, but there is some, some great stuff that surrounds this. Um, and so we'll go ahead and start on verse 7. Sometimes in your Bibles, there's like different headings. Um, number 7 starts talking about God's love. So we'll start there. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Number nine, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. You know, I pause there because I always find that so significant. If you're a parent, you have a little bit of an understanding, not quite as much as what God would, but you have such a connection with your kids. So just thinking about the fact that God gave up his only son, his only divine son, hits a little bit differently as you become a parent. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since it is God, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we might live, oh, I'm sorry, that we might live in him and he in us. Further, we have seen with our eyes and now testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. In verse 15, all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. And we know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love 
live in God and God in them. I'm going to pause for just a second. I know that was a lot of love over and over and over and over and over. But this next verse is kind of important. And verse 17 kind of sums up the thing. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. So that gets a little bit to his second coming, right? As he returns and calls his people to him, and we stand before him. I don't know about you, fam, but I would love to hear the words, well done. I would love for my father to look at me and say, daughter, I'm so proud of you. Now, I know we'll be accountable for things that, you know, we were disobedient on. I know. But I just look forward to the day where I can meet him and hear the words, well done. So how do we get to there? What is it that God wants the most from us? All the way through scripture, no matter where you turn, you see God's love. And you see this mandate, especially in the New Testament, where he's telling us to love one another. You see it in the scripture in the Old Testament as he talks about the injustice and how it breaks his heart on how people just treat each other poorly. So if we are to love others, that's what verse 17 is getting at. So God made the first move. He didn't just stand back and allow us to live in, a, in separation, although that is the consequence of our sin, separation. But instead, he gave himself as a sacrifice so that we have the option to choose eternal life. We don't have to live in separation. We don't have to be separated from him eternally, but we do have to choose to accept him. And if we truly love him, we have a response. A life in fellowship and intimacy with him here and now is available to us, but also beyond in paradise. Jesus gave up his divine throne in the heavens and humbled himself by becoming a little baby. I don't know about you. I don't know about me. Would we give up our throne to lay in, in hay as a naked baby? Kind of takes a lot of work, doesn't it? We skip over it. We celebrate. But would we really do that? So we look, to, look on with anticipation and wait for the return of Christ one day. And in the meantime, we have work to do. On the next slide, yes, it's purple. I know we don't usually use purple, but... You know, our, our sermon slide, I was trying to find us a nice, you know, Christmas star. And the closest I could get was, you know, a nice guy with stars. And it happened to be purple. So I felt the license to use purple today, my favorite color. God loved us first. And if we love him, we should emulate his behavior by loving others. See, we can't just say that we love God if we are not in turn, loving others. It makes us a liar. I'm sure many could quote the scripture. If we say we love God, but we don't love others, we are a liar. Often on Christmas, we think about giving. We've discussed the gift of love that God gave us. However, if we claim to be his children, then we are called to respond to his love with our own gift of love in return. We are called to love others, but not as the world loves. See, it's different. There's so much in our culture, in our time, that has love so confused. All the brokenness in relationships and families because love is misunderstood. So I think if we just take a minute, we can talk about the difference between godly love and worldly love, and that'll help quite a bit with understanding what God calls us to. Now, I know that um, we're not talking about Easter today, but in my thinking this week, God reminded me about 
Judas. And if you think about the interesting relationship there between Judas and Jesus, Jesus knew all along that Judas was going to betray him. But the whole time he treated him not only as a friend, but more intimately as a brother. He cared for him. And on the night of his, of his arrest, Jesus washed the feet of the man who was going to betray him. Oh, I find that so astonishing. Because it's easy for us to love our family. It's easy to, you know, love the ones that are kind to us and who treat us with love. But it's a whole nother ball game to love those that are not kind to us, that have hurt us deeply, that have caused us harm. But if we're really truly following Jesus' example and we are loving others like Jesus loved, then we wash the feet of those who hurt us. We offer kindness. We continue to love. That's a whole different kind of love. So on this next slide, there's a couple of them, and this list could go on endlessly. So I just chose a few. Love is an action, not a feeling. It's something we express with our actions, not a feeling, because feelings fade. Love is about those around me. The world wants us to think that it's all about me. Love is unconditional. The world would have us think that it's based on, you know, what has this person done for me lately? They haven't invited me over in a while. They haven't, you know, helped me clean the house lately, so my kids must not love me, right? <laughs> love is about giving and serving. It's not about getting. How often do we find that in the world, if we are not receiving, if we're not feeling like this is solving my problem or filling me on the inside, then it's not worth it. But that's not what love is. That's not what godly love is. That's worldly love. We continue on the next slide. Godly love, love is a commitment. It's not a phase. You don't fall out of love. That's more of an internal heart problem. That's focusing on what they can do for us. So love focuses on meeting the needs of those around us, not about getting my needs met. And so what I think we fall victim to sometimes is that sometimes we are so hurt by not getting what we feel we need from someone else. We feel unloved sometimes. And that separates us and has us questioning our relationships. But if we really focus on the fact that our love, our validation, our identity, we should be receiving from Christ. We're not called to receive from others. We're called to give to others. And if God is asking you to give to others, don't you think in return that he has a way to fill you? It may not be the person that you're holding in that expectation. It may not be that. There's some relationships that may never work quite the way that you desire them to. But if we're focused on the one that never fails us, the one that's already given us, the greatest gift that's ever been, his love is uncomparable to any human on earth that we could desire love from. And it's freely available to us. We just have to choose it. We just have to accept it. We have to listen for his voice. We have to see the small blessings that happen on a daily basis. Someone smiles at you in the store. You drop something and a random stranger picks it up for you. These are all blessings of God's love poured out to you. Whether or not we, we see it as such, all day long God is showing us his love. We just need to open our hearts and our eyes so that we can see it and recognize it. 
The holidays are tough, y'all. I don't know about you, but there's so much hustle and bustle and get this done and the kids have this going on and the to-do list gets longer and longer. I need to open my eyes and recognize all the small little gifts of love that he gives me throughout the day. I need that encouragement. So this list could go on forever, but we're going to leave it at that for now. Sacrificial love finds joy in elevating others above themselves. Now, Jesus was our perfect example. In every step he took, he showed sacrificial love. He invited over the widow to dine with him. He ate with sinners. He touched the diseased lepers. I know that seems a little interesting in the face of COVID because we're so afraid of one another right now. It just is, is what it is. But Jesus reached out and touched him. I want to challenge all of us. Sometimes what I find is when I'm feeling empty, like I'm feeling that I need something. God has prompted me and he's showed me time and time again. If I'm feeling empty, sometimes all I need to do is give love to someone else. And that simple act, that simple sacrifice of myself to fill someone else, in turn fills me with joy. Are you stuck right now? Are you hurting right now? Is there something that you need inside? Ask God about it. Ask him to show you opportunities where you can give it away. And let him surprise you with how much he fills you inside. We have to stop thinking about ourselves and start thinking about others. We can find joy in helping others succeed by giving out provision, by choosing charity over materialism. That's hard at Christmas, I know. All the presents, I get it. But what if we gave it away? By working through conflict and restoring relationships. That's always a hard one at Christmas. But you feel this pull, don't we? To forgive, to work through the conflict, to invite back into relationship. That's godly love, folks. It's not easy. God never said that loving others was going to be easy. But it's necessary. And by listening to those who are struggling, do you know that sometimes you don't even have to have advice? You just have to be present and able to listen. Sometimes just offering that space and having a moment for people to, to just talk through what they're going through gives them such a breath and allows them to move into a healthier space. What a gift just to listen. Can we give those gifts? Can we put relationships before tasks? And most importantly, by sharing Christ's love. God's love is shown throughout the entirety of Scripture, culminates in the Gospels with Jesus stepping out of heaven, giving up his throne, all while laying in, a, in the hay and taking his first breath. The significance of that. Can you just hear? Have you ever listened to a baby take their first breath? There's just something precious about that moment. <clears throat> this Advent season, we reflect and we celebrate the greatest gift ever given. Love himself. Yes, Jesus is love. And he gave himself the greatest gift ever given. So for reflection and action, I just put a few things up there. When have we withheld love? Love. 
Is there a convicting moment this past week where we've withheld love? Have we asked for forgiveness? What can you do this Christmas to love others like Jesus? Remember, love is an action. We can say it, but do we live it? What can we do this Christmas to love others? I know we all have somebody in our minds that we can think about that could use an extra dose. What is God calling us to? And reflect on Jesus, who is the gift of love. We engage with Advent, the Christmas story in the Bible, the greatest gift. Reflect on that. Do we spend time as a family talking about that? We spend a whole lot of time getting ready for Christmas, but how much time do we spend talking through the reason for the season? Do the kids know? Does that father-in-law know? Who knows the reason for the season? Is God inviting us into a space where we can share that gift? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. The Christmas season always gets us so excited. We think about you. We think about that greatest gift ever given. What humbling it must have been for you to give up your throne and to step into this earth as a human. Restricted to the only what a human body could do. Lord, what a gift it is. I pray that today as we go, you remind us of all the gifts that you give us throughout the day and that we can smile as we recognize you in all of the small things, God. This Christmas, help us to love others like you love. Help us to give your love to others and feel the joy that comes from loving others like you. Help us to slow down and remember exactly why we celebrate. I thank you and I praise you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.